Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. So far on Midnight Chats, we've spoken to people from all different backgrounds、um, with wildly different stories to tell、um, and had some really interesting in depth conversations. Sometimes they've got Loads to say, other times they're a little bit quieter and have less to say. My guest on the latest podcast, this is episode 14, is a man who definitely has a lot to say. And I mean that、uh, as a compliment as you're about to hear our conversation. My guest was Ashley Walters, who you might also know as Asher D. In terms of a quick recap on his career, he started out acting at a fairly young age in his teens. He was in programs like Grange Hill and、uh, The Adventures of a Young Indiana Jones. And then in his late teens, he joined the So Solid crew,、uh, the infamous So Solid crew, who went on to have、um, big success in the UK. They had a number one single with 21 Seconds and won a Brit Award.、Uh, after that, Ashley found himself.、Uh, Spending a stint in prison after he got arrested for having a firearm. And after that, he came out of jail and has appeared in loads of different films, including、uh, 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying,、um, but mostly on TV actually, very recognisable from things like Hustle, he's been in Doctor Who, and probably most notably、um, Top Boy on Channel 4 from a couple of years ago. There's two series of that, and he talks about that in the podcast actually about、uh, the potential for a third series. Ashley was probably one of my favourite guests so far. He was unbelievably open and kind of honest. He turned up to the podcast recording with his wife and his two year old daughter and their newborn son, who was literally four days old. And I quite like that he brought his family along with him. And you can also you can hear them in the podcast,、um, so listen out for them. We recorded this one at the South Bank Centre in London, overlooking the River Thames. Because Ashley, next month in November, is going to be part of their Being a Man Festival.、Uh, he's going to be doing some talking there, which is, looks like a really interesting event. So, yeah, in it, we covered a whole load of different stuff.、Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot to get into. We talked about parenthood, we talked about Ashley's time in prison, we talked about the legacy of So Solid Crew, and we talked about his future plans, things like Top Boy. And Ashley's just a fascinating guy, he had a lot to say. And、uh, we really enjoyed having him on. So I'm going to let you listen to this. This is episode 14 of Midnight Chats with Ashley Walters. Ashley, thanks for joining us on Midnight Chats. It's good to have you here. Good to be here, man.、Um, before we start, I should probably say congratulations because just a few metres away from us, we've got your、uh, latest addition to your family. Yeah, yeah, River Waters in the building.、Yeah. Um, it's his first interview with me. <laughs> <laughs> How are you feeling? I'm How's feeling good, man. I'm feeling good. You know, like, at the end of the day, we, this is child number eight between us, between me and my wife. You know, we're, we're kind of dab hands at, like,、yeah. at being parents, I suppose. But、um, obviously, every new addition is, like a, is, a, is a blessing. And you learn in every, every day as a, as a father as well. You never know everything. I feel blessed. I just feel blessed that I've got like, such a big family and、yeah. you know, that I'm, I'm able to take care of them in the way that I do. And that my whole aim is to just do. As much as I can, or maybe better than my parents did for me. Not saying that they didn't do great for、yeah. me, you know, but I want to try and, I always want to try and achieve. So, River is just another reason for me to,、um, to push myself further. We all look remarkably fresh given that, like, you're still in the first few well, days. Well, she, she, my wife does. <laughs> <Yeah> . <laughs> I don't know about me. Yeah, We've got your little girl there my watching girl, some Peppa Pig love, as well.、Yeah. She's a Peppa Pig、um, fanatic. Do you spend hours upon end watching Peppa Pig? I spend hours and end watching Peppa Pig. I spend hours, I spend pounds and pounds on Peppa Pig merchandising. <laughs> I, yeah, well, she's got everything. And look, the backpack's down there. The got a Peppa Pig t shirt. Headphones. 
like everything, everything, everything. So, um, so Phil, Phil Davis owes me a bit of pee. He owes me a bit of money, and he's uh, he's the writer of um, Peppa Pig. I think the the guy who owns it. You're paying his mortgage. Yeah, probably, probably. I'd like to come. To eat. The least he could do is like give me a call and say, bring her around. You know, give her a free teddy or whatever, and just show some love. To be honest, so Phil, if you're listening, holler at me. Sort it out. Yeah. What are those first kind of few days and weeks like when when a new arrival comes? Is it kind of pandemonium or is it all kind of calm? It seems calm at the moment. Mm. I mean, yeah, we had just come. My mum came around the other day. My mum and my um, my stepfather, and they were like, we were all sitting on the sofa, and Dan had a Maya sitting next to her. And the baby just on her lap asleep, and we were all just talking and just doing our normal stuff. And my mum was like, "You guys are quite weird." <laughs> we were like, "What are you talking about?" She was like, "Well, it's just like you just don't really care. It's just like nothing." We kind of just learnt that you know, it is chaos. It yeah. is. I mean, to a lot of people outside looking in, you know, it's chaos. But it's our organised chaos we're quite calm with it man river has been a, a really refreshing experience i mean remember he's he's not even four days old yet but he um since he's been in mummy's tummy he's not given us any problems hardly you wait till he's a teenager <laughs> yeah 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 i mean <laughs> yeah, that's a given that's a given trust me we've got a te- we've got teenagers now that we're having to deal with and it, it can be quite hectic at times but you kind of you 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 hold on to you hold on to your memories of being that age yourself as much as you can. I think as a parent, you have to do that. But you also have to, um, you know, you have to be consistent. You know, there's parents that regularly do a lot of bad stuff around their children, I suppose. If they do it every day, the kid's not going to understand that there's something wrong with it. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. It becomes yeah, normal to yeah, them. Normal. So we try to do that with positivity with like with just doing the positive things as much as we can we're not the best parents in the world and we make mistakes and whatever but and I, w- I always want my kids to to grow with grow with the you know the freedom to to think the way that they mm. they want to think and mm. to kind of help mold themselves but at the same time you've got to kind of be there to kind of guide them in in the right direction and help them along the way i started as such a young parent i had my first one i was 17 going on 18 you know, he's more like my friend than mm. my son, mm. really. So we have our ups and downs. I haven't even spoken. We're not even talking now, if I'm honest. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because there's some things that he's doing I disagree with and I'd like him to do a different way or whatever. And we, we just have that relationship. So we're able to talk to each other on, on a different sort of level. I think with the, the younger ones, I've had to learn that I'm no longer 17, a child growing up, bringing up a child. So mm. I've had to kind of, man up a bit more and kind of set a a few more boundaries and and parameters but um, essentially I'm kind of you know I'm doing the same thing I'm a very creative person I don't believe in constantly organising everything and Mm. I like to just adapt when things change around me or whatever I suppose Danielle's the opposite to me in that sense she needs to know what's going on how it's happening or whatever if you go into my into the kids' bedroom, it's like you know, World War Two bunker. <laughs> the supplies and all the stuff is there. It's just absolutely crazy. But for me, as a parent, if I was the one having the child by myself, I, they would probably wouldn't even have a pack of nappies until yeah. the day it's born. Do you know what I mean? Because that's how I, I kind of am. So, but we complement each other in that sense, and they're getting the best of both worlds. You mentioned that you've got teenagers now. Yeah. Can you remember what it feels like to be thirteen, fourteen, fifteen? Because it's a time in your life where you do you change loads don't you and also it's quite no matter who your parents are there's always a sort of they're still they're your pet at that age you're like oh mum and dad like kind yeah. of, they, it's just, everything they do almost seems to feel like they're interfering in, in your oh, yeah, development of course, it? of course. It's, it's, it's so awkward the thing with my mum yeah she just didn't care so she just didn't have no she just didn't care not at any point she gave me any leeway it's GCSEs you know People would ring my house phone, is Ashley there? No, he's not. And I'd be standing right there mm. next to her and she'd be like, no, he's not. No, he's not about, sorry. And I'd be like, I, I, I wanted to take that phone call. And she's like, oh, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I just really don't care. You're doing this and this is what's happening. So is it like a, just a form of discipline? It was a form of discipline. She never, like, that's one thing about my mum. She never, she never hit me. Mm. Never beat me. I never got beatings. I never got that whole traditional, you know, what people would say, Caribbean, Caribbean upbringing. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? I was like, my mum is very, very British. She's very, very 
Union Jack site. So okay. she th- she's not in touch with my granny's culture as much. Right. So her whole stance was the one thing that she did bang over my head was that you are black. I said it was hard being told that <laughs> every day you're black. You need to do better than everyone else. You're black. You're black. You're black. And I kind of. And my mum was in education as well. She works. She works in human resources. So okay. she was like, you know, for 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 the council. Mm. So she was kind of hiring teachers and mm. letting teachers go and stuff like that. So, um, so she, she held herself to like a standard. Yeah. So there was a very right. high standard, high okay. high standard. And from like, you know, from eleven years old, I was literally coming home after school myself, cleaning the whole of the house starting dinner washing the dishes doing my homework and everything and that was a daily routine I thank her for it now but at the time I bloody hated her did for it did you like rebel against it no never never I was so I, to be honest I was too scared my mum she never raised her hand to me or whatever but if you meet her as a person she's in the She's quite, um, you know, she's quite Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> she's formidable. She, she, yeah, she's, she, she's, she's a hard woman, so... <laughs> and she, she, she finds it really, really hard to say that she's wrong. Okay. Or that, you know what I mean, that, that she's sorry. Or even sometimes that she loves me. I know she does, but we have conversations where I'll be like, all right, love you, Mum. All right, bye. <laughs> you, you know, you're just kind of like, why can't you just say it? You have to do a lot to make her seem proud of you. Right. Even though I know she's proud of me anyway, yeah. deep down. But she always be honest with you, always be tell you what she thinks? Most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. Most of the time. Most of the time. Sometimes she does it through telling other people that will tell you, i.e. Danielle right. or whatever. But, Pass um, the message on. Yeah. I mean, like, our first experience of that was <laughs> when me and Dan were getting together. She said to Dan, don't do it. Really? She tried, <laughs> to, she tried <laughs> yeah. to put you off? Yeah, yeah. She's like, don't do it. He's, he, he, he'll ruin your life. Don't you? <laughs> you don't need to be around this sort of guy. <laughs> I was like, well, all right, thank you. Did you thank what you, do, what do you even say? What do you say to your mum in that I, circumstance? I, I, you like, I, I, do you know? I stood this day. I haven't probably had it out with her about yeah, it. Can't but, really I kind of, but yeah. yeah, but not. I didn't want to push my luck, but I was just like, you know, like why would you do that? But in a strange way, I mean, I suppose why I haven't had it out is because it's true. we me and Dan were opposites, so. For everyone, not just my mum or anyone, but her mum and everyone, no one could understand why are you two together? Like, how is that going to work? Ashley's like, you know, mad creative person, up and down, everywhere, you know, this and that, whatever's going on. And you're kind of Miss 9 to 5, cool, calm, and it just, no one one could understand it. And my reputation precedes me as well, so... You know, <laughs> I've not been a stranger to to being out there with women and stuff like that as well. So it's just like no one could just could understand why Dan would want to be involved with me or why I would be picking to be with a woman that was like that. But I suppose I, we needed each other. And you meet in the middle, basically. Yeah, yeah, we've met in the middle. I, I weren't thinking about marriage homemaking and stuff like that I was in a whirlwind you know hotel to hotel this and that well, I'll deal with that next week sort of lifestyle and I've had to realise that you know that's part of my game I was kind of missing there needs to be some foundation there needs mm-hmm. to be some boundary and whatever so rather than sticking you know party in a week maybe it's just the weekend now or whatever <laughs> you know what I mean? turn it down some, some sort of um, some sort of more of a, a focus a more directed focus in what, in what I'm doing and um, to be fair since I met Dan my career has just gone from strength to strength yeah. and a lot of other things have, have been a lot better as well so so listen let's talk about music and let's yeah. talk about the events you got coming up so people can imagine the picture of where we're sat at the moment we are on the top floor I think maybe or close to the top floor I think the, it is we're at the top yeah yeah at the South Bank Centre on the River Thames in London um, we can literally see the Thames maybe 100 metres away and you're going to be uh, back here at the South Bank Centre at the end of November because you're going to be taking part in their festival which is called the Being a Man Festival and BAM. There's, there's lo- yeah BAM for sure <laughs> yeah. it's, there's loads of interesting stuff going on with it there's Sir Roger Moore's doing something mm-hmm. uh, Kelly Okariki from Block Party um, yeah. Professor Green's doing some stuff yeah. um, tell me a bit about the event that you're taking part in the biggest part for me is going to be kind of just giving a um, a talk about my career and about how I got to where I am. I speak that, you know, that is, is goes hand in hand with 
I suppose, what being a man is about. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I've, the, the trials and tribulations that I've had through my life to get where I am through the music industry, through the acting industry and just like, personally or whatever has kind of shaped me into the person I am today. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm one of those people, I keep it quite real when I do interviews or mm -hmm. when I'm talking about myself or whatever. You probably heard I've told you stuff that, I, you know, a lot of people wouldn't sit down mm -hmm. with journalists or whatever mm -hmm. and, and say, but... I think it's it's important, it's essential that people hear everything about it. From a very early age, I've understood that. I've understood that um, this is not about me. That I think I kind of worked that out more when I was in prison. That I'm 80% of what I'm doing, 80, 90% of what I'm doing, if you can put a percentage on it, is about who's coming next. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? So... You know, I can it's about sharing your experience. Yeah, I can, I can enjoy the spoils and, and, the, and, and the rewards of doing my job, but the, the most important thing is that someone else is inspired by what I've done. That's quite an unselfish thing to say, I'd, I'd suggest. I think it, it's that unselfish that it's selfish. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I never kind of, I don't want to give myself that much credit. Um, and in, in, in all honesty, I don't really think too much about what I do. So maybe that's why I can't... You see, when it comes to acting and stuff like that, I really get upset with... Not upset, but I watch a lot of other actors, you know, go over and over stuff and make notes and this and that or whatever. I just pretty much just turn up. So, seriously, like, that, that's, my, that's my method. That's the way I work. And it, it's not broken so far, so I ain't trying to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm more concerned about how I affect other people. And I'm more concerned, like, I've got younger brothers, I've got younger kids or whatever that I watch that are hugely influenced by people in my position. And I just feel like having this voice, it, if I'm going to be, you know, one of the only ones that are keeping it real, then that's the way that I should do it. I want people to understand that this is not a barrel of laughs. There's no glamour to this situation. The glamour is in your heart. The glamour is in you accepting and being happy with what you already have. Anything else becomes a bonus. And it's slightly insignificant at times. And I think people forget that. So we're bombarded with like constant images of flashy cars and money and this and that, you know, with the rise of Instagram and whatever. Yeah. Even my kids are like, you know, sometimes my son looks at me like, why don't you have a Bentley? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, what are you... <laughs> what's going on, bro? So all the money spent on Peppa Pig. <laughs> yeah, he, but yeah, because he doesn't understand that I more concerned about what's going on with him yeah. or whatever and nothing's what it seems I ain't, I'm not making Bentley money as far as I'm concerned mm. do you know what I mean so I want to I rather than go out and buy a car I'd rather spend it on buying a house or doing this or doing mm. that I think like it, in over the last like 20 years or whatever it's kind, kind of become a blur as to you know what is important mm. I suppose and everyone's going to have their own focus or whatever but I think the core needs to be dealt with first and when you're going out there if I do go to buy a Bentley car or whatever just for example I know I'm promoting Bentley now but <laughs> if I do go out to buy a Bentley car it's not because of my ego it's because you know I can buy the car I want the car or do you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I, my foundation and my core is already set I know it's getting like deep or whatever but I'm saying so that's why I kind of view my job as is doing stuff like this uh, uh, talking to kids um, mentoring and trying to inspire other people through the way that I know I can tell a story. Do you know what I'm saying? It's also, you've obviously had your ups and downs, let's put it that way, but is it important that you're basically honest about that and, like, mistakes that, or otherwise that you make in your life? Because otherwise people are presented with this depiction of, of getting to the point where you are mm. and people just sort of... It feels like an almost like another world, right? Well, exactly. I mean, there's no point in me talking about where I am, what I do, or whatever, if they don't know how I've got here. Especially mm. if they, when you know, they're alienated. And they look at me like, "Wow, it's Ashley Waters." I could never do what he's done. What's the point, then? Mm. Do you know what I mean? They they have to understand that I was them. Mm. <laughs> at some stage, you know what I'm saying. We we can relate or whatever. And I'm not just talking about black kids 
Asian kids or whatever. I'm just talking about people in general. Yeah. Everyone from all walks of life. There are poor white people as well. You know, mm-hmm. like this is not just a <laughs> just a like you know an ethnic minority thing. I, I suppose that it's more focused on that because the numbers may be higher in this and that statistics or whatever. But I'm just talking about everyone in general. When I look at my kids and their friends and whatever that. My kids don't see colour in anything no more. Mm-hmm. They've grown up in such a diverse kind of community that that's different from our generation. Yeah, 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 it's maybe. completely it's different. certainly different yeah. from the generations from before us. Yeah, exactly. But for for my kids, they don't care. You know what I mean? It's just like it's nothing. So I just want them to to see a bit of the pain and the the, the side that is completely not glamorous. Mm. And the moments I cried and the moments I felt I couldn't do it anymore and I had depression and I you know, I had to have counselling and I had to do this and do that or whatever in order for me to still be here doing what I'm doing as much as they're going to go wrong wow, you know, that must have been really hard at the same time it's kind of I want them to go home and go well, I could mm. I've just been through that so, but I could still do what he's doing then or mm. whatever the only thing I, I tell people all the time is nothing for anyone has landed on the plate everything has to start somewhere so your journey starts with you and I always use like that Morgan Freeman Mm -hmm. as an example of he didn't make it until driving Miss Daisy at that point the guy was already nearly what was he nearly 50 or something like that Mm. years old and he'd been trying for so long but he's one of my inspirations if he gave up I don't would I be here would you know what I mean? Would that other guy to be there or whatever? And those people are kind of shaping TV, film, and making it more diverse for all of us and creating this whole industry. So everything has a cause and effect and whatever. And it's just beautiful to know, you know, to have that human interaction with people. I can't stand artists or actors or whatever that just don't have time. Mm. Seriously, because... There's always time. At the end of the day, you can always make time. But that whole, you know, I don't. I refuse. I don't have security. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think all those people just cloud a situation. If I walk mm-hmm. down the street or whatever, I, I don't get mobbed like I'm, you know, Wayne Rooney, Wayne Rooney <laughs> or Justin <laughs> Bieber or whatever. I'm not having those sort of paparazzi problems. But when I talk to someone and they, you know, to to a little kid's parent will say like, "Oh, my son loves you" or whatever, mm-hmm. or you know, you've what you did was amazing or you changed this or you've done that or whatever. I'm humbled by it, man. Mm. I'm, and I'm inspired and it makes me want to do better and it makes me know what's going on around me. It grounds me. I know what I have to do. I can gauge people's feelings about me. Do I need to be a bit more this, that, where, whatever. Whereas I think if you're in a bubble of, you know, you're in a Kanye West Kim Kardashian bubble and no one can't get into you, no mm. real people can't interact with you or whatever, you start to forget why you're here and mm. what, you know what I mean, what your cause is, what you're actually there to do. And it's not actually to feed your own ego is to you started off being an inspiration yeah. to us which is what made you big and then as as much as you can keep in touch with that original foundational kind of vibe i think the longer the career you'll mm. have it sounds like what you're saying is the reward for you for doing what you do is actually the thing that for some other people maybe in a similar position is the thing that they're trying to get away from so if you're walking down the high street and you've just been to boots or something mm. and somebody stops you in the street and says Ashley you know you've been a big inspiration to me like I've started taking acting classes or yeah. something like that that feels that sounds like that's your sort of vindication for doing what you do yeah, whereas for some people they would they would do everything in their power to kind of avoid having those conversations because they're just either I don't know scared of them or just of course I mean and more importantly if you check it yeah I'll, I'll take it a little bit deeper you see those people they're rich a lot of them are rich <laughs> I'm saying the people that don't want to do the ground work thing. Do you know, me and we get this all the time because we'll be on the tube or we're walking through Chapel Market in Angel or we're at mm. Pizza Hut in Leicester Square, or whatever. And people are like, "What the fuck are you doing here? What are you doing here? Why are you on the tube? Whatever." And my answer is always like, "Well, we're just eating a pizza." Just, pizza Hut is good. Yeah, <laughs> I like pizza. Mm. I like Domino's too. Sometimes I'm there. You know, there. and there are other brands of pizza as well that you could buy. Um, but <laughs> like we kind of. 
we just we forget I think ourselves like our whole life is just about kind of keeping it normal having the kids having a normal life and it doesn't have to be nannies and private schools and this and that it's just like just do the damn thing and, and kind of go to work it's a job you know what I mean and when that job's not happening we're a family and we we live so that's what we're all about and I think I think people should know where you're coming from and how you feel whether that's fire my Twitter because I, I have PR companies calling me going you need to give up your Twitter and your Instagram you're not really good at what you're doing it's inconsistent you post the wrong stuff at the wrong times and do this and do that but I'm just like well I've signed up for Instagram just to put pictures of my family and my life when I want I didn't do it as no corporate you know move to make people want to buy into me more or whatever it's mm-hmm. like you see you know I'm human Mm. I think it's like even me I get caught up in the fact that if I met Will Smith I'd be like <gasps> you know when I met 50 Cent when I did Get Rich or Die Trying I couldn't talk for three days <laughs> whilst I was rehearsing with this guy I'm meant to be improvising and stuff and I'm just looking at him like with my jaw kind of open people are coming up there and shut your mouth <laughs> the hell is wrong with you um, and then he got fired off that job because of that because I was drifting through it mm. I couldn't believe the position I was in rather mm. than Embracing it and take, you know what I mean? Mm. Taking the ball by the horn. So, you know, there's such a, a, a huge hype. After f- three weeks of being with 50, he's a normal guy. But not everyone gets to have that, mm. get into that circle. Mm. You see what I'm saying? But mm. once I got into it, it's like this, it's kind of boring. Not boring, but you know, like yeah, he's he, just normal. You know, he, he's not no superhero. He's just a normal man. He argues with his wife on the phone, and you know, his son comes on set, and he's a dad. And then he go out drinking, and they would do this and do that and whatever. And it's just like they're normal people. It's not yeah. no, yeah. you know, there's no hype. There's no hype. But they, I think a lot of those people would refuse to let us see that. And if they did, I think there'd be more people. Achieving, I think mm. there'll be more people believing that you, they could be that person. But do you think that some people aspire to something that isn't really real, and once you get there, you're still a real person? It's just not selling people something that's like a dream or unreal, but just yeah. I, I, listen, I, there's not really a question in that, was there? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just, <laughs> but I'm going to answer it. the non-question. And no, it is like. It's a bit of both because I think it is real. It does exist, the position that I have or being like, you know, there are times I can, I had a problem with Deliveroo. They refused to give me my food at the door because my name's Ashley and it's a girl's name and it's not me. Yeah? <laughs> and right. I videoed the guy saying it to me. I put it on my Insta and my Twitter and Deliveroo contacted me. And was like, we are really, really sorry. But that's because of who I... Because I put the tweet out and mm. it got, like, so many hits and whatever. And their PR team must have been like, oh, shit. Uh, you know, and got back to me. Whereas maybe they wouldn't have got back to the, your average person. You know what I mean? Or whatever. So, to, I suppose for those things, there is a position. There's a You do have a voice. And it's just about how you use that voice. Do you mm. understand? If you use it... There's no point in me getting here and just using it for my own personal financial gain. Mm. I've got to use it. If I, I watch the news. I see kids stabbing each other and war and all sorts of stuff. So if you ask me to come on this week or Peston on Sunday, I'm going in. Do you understand? I'm not going to sit there and be going, well, yeah, you know, my new movie's coming out. Rare, rare. I'm going to be saying, what's happening with the money? What are you talking about? NHS ain't got no money when you're spending this millions of pounds on war every day or whatever. Just, we're all happy for you to just stop going to war. Let's take the risk mm-hmm. of... You know, having a, a medium sort of defence or whatever, but let's keep out of everyone else's business and make sure that we can support our own people that are in this country and the immigrants and everyone else that's coming in and give them the life that they deserve. It's basic humanity. There's constant things that you you can't you you watch or whatever. I'll be like, I'll, I just that doesn't make any sense. There is no money for operations. There's no money for this and that or whatever. When you guys are blatantly killing people. On a daily basis and fighting wars and this and that that's costing millions and millions and millions of pounds per day, Mm -hmm. might I add. And then we get told, sorry, we're closing down that youth club, we're closing down that hospital ward, we're doing this, doctors don't want to work as much, we can't give police more money. 
because the shifts are there going to strike. The tubes keep on locking. Do you know what I'm saying? Our lives are constantly dis- destructed by power and all of those stupid things. So I think if my voice is any use, it's for that. It's to do something special with it. That's why I was saying about what I do is only a minor percentage of what I'm actually here for. This is, I, I am a vessel now. I'm, I'm becoming like, you know, I'm a way to help other people. Uh, a way, do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, being an inspiration just by being and doing what I do, but at the same time using my voice to a certain extent. And that's why, I, you know, I love artists like, like Wretch Free too, mm-hmm. like Swiss, mm-hmm. like a lot of underrated Akala, you know, people like that. Like, mm-hmm. I kind of, they've risked the money, the glitz, the glamour and all the hype and the number one singles to put out a message mm. that is they feel is going to try and help change the world and push something forward. Whether it does or it, it doesn't, who cares? They dedicated themselves to doing that and there will be a few small group of people, you know, a niche market or whatever that will be influenced and motivated by that and maybe even like, you know, sometimes live your their life culturally by... Mm some of the things that these people are saying because that is true about a voice I, did, I used to hate the police for saying that about me all the time that you just talk about guns and violence and this and that and you're glamorising violence and this and that and stop using the N word you know you can't be calling your own people that or other people who said that or whatever and I used to be like I'll just do what the F I want mm. but it's true the words are so powerful when did you first realise that and kind of learn that was that after you saw the influence of like So Solid crew and like kind of what what that had become and it became like a kind of cultural force didn't it mm. and it was it shortly after that that you realised that was almost what your role was and what you wanted to do if you, you know to pursue basically in the future it was, yeah it was around the time of prison So Solid and whatever but more importantly I think what happened was there was a definite um change in society's opinion or the government's opinion about you know when we had the uh, the supposed rise in gun crime um we became the scapegoats for it in my opinion at that time it was it was tony blair need someone needed to take the blame for why black children were sh- shooting each other you know it couldn't be the police even to the other day this guy this psco guy was jailed for 24 years for raping two children under five and four do you know what i see on my news clowns clowns and kim kardashian getting robbed is the headline news not this policeman and i i i for a fact know that that's because the the image of the police can they can't it, the minute they, they we keep on you know they are degraded less people are going to be confident in them do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's, the situation is going to get worse. There's a huge gap between the police and communities, which is why they brought in these community support police officers in the yeah. first place that don't have to be fully trained to be policemen or whatever, but they're normal volunteers and this and that. And now look what they've done. Do you know what I'm saying? As far as that's what the me, the, the average persons would be, would be thinking. I just think it's, it's, it's a sad, sad world where we can't, you know, where rather than we address issues for what they are like the reason why it's so solid and a lot of other music artists and rap artists then and now were constantly surrounded by guns firearms or whatever is not because we want to, to be surrounded by guns firearms drugs or whatever it's because those things are pushed into the community they don't exist in a lot of other places do you see what I'm saying if I grew up in in Chelsea or in Kensington in a townhouse with a middle class family or whatever and really you know I probably would see my dad might do cocaine every now and again or this or that or whatever you don't get it twisted those people are not you know too far fetched from it but no. I'm saying but it, it, as a child in that environment I wouldn't think I have to go to jail in order to be respected in my area I wouldn't feel like you know well I'm going to sell drugs because my older brother does my uncle does and this and that or whatever that's not it's a completely different environment. So my aspirations, are, what is, I'm inspired by, will be completely different. Mm. And what I'm saying is, Soul Solid grew up, came from that belly of the beast. They, they, there was nothing else we thought we could do. When we started making music, we weren't sitting there like you know we are. We're we're reporters and journalists, and we're telling you what's going on in this part of the world. We were just expressing our feelings, mm. and it just takes for some a smart person 
i.e. our Prime Minister or the leader of our free world or whatever to go, these people are actually in pain. Mm. Rather, what, what they did was, you're evil. Oh, vilified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? And you become the reason why there's gun crime, the reason why there's a problem. I went through like so much stuff. I was, I was being shot at week in, week out. I was being kidnapped. I was being stabbed. I had guns put to my children's head and all sorts of stuff like that or whatever. No one wanted to help me. The police didn't want to help me. The minute I got caught with a firearm, I just got put in prison. Do you know what I'm saying? No one asked why. No one asked, do you know, how are we going to rehabilitate you or this and that or whatever. You're just put into the, the system or whatever. And for some people, you never flipping come out. I, I saw kids in there and, and boys in there or whatever that I cried for sometimes because their mentality how deeply ingrained they were in that lifestyle is scary and this is the extent of what our society is but no one's really kind of looking at the actual these people don't want to they're actually scared themselves these kids you have to look beyond that facade you have to look beyond the you know the the bravado and whatever that they kind of they're showing they actually want help they actually want people like me to go bro put down the gun and come studio with me or come and be in this film or whatever they'll be straight away they go ah fuck that yeah. you know what I'm saying you see a completely different side to these people I, I was banged up with rapists all sorts of people and I'm not say, saying what they did was right or whatever but I tell you one thing now they were normal people mm. if you could say that do you know what I mean mm. it, it, like you know I wouldn't want to do certain things that they had done or whatever but the way that, how passionate they talked about their mum or their kids, or this and that, or whatever, like, they became human to, to me. I was thinking, whoa, why would you do something like that, or whatever, but they either had mental health issues, you know, a lot of stuff. It's another thing that we've been talking about, mental health. It's just a huge problem in the world, let alone in the UK, and it's just not addressed at all. Like, money-wise, it's just don't do anything. And most of our crime, and whatever, it's down to mental health. mental health. It's down to mental health. Mm. I can't see no other reason why people would do some of the stuff that they're doing, the things that they're doing. And depression is a big thing. Mm. Mm. Um, and it needs to be addressed. And so I know I've gone on a, on a little run or whatever, but that's my, that's my passion. That's what, like, I'm really... I, the things I think about, the things that move me. What do you think the legacy of So Solid Crew was then in the end? Like, in terms of the message, in terms of the culture, did it do positive things for you? Do you look back oh, on it yeah, yeah. Listen, yeah, let me not bang on about the negative side of, of life. It's, br- it's done brilliant things for me. Do you think it's done brilliant things for other people, like, in terms oh. of the inspiration? I mean, certainly, I don't think people can argue that, like, musically, yeah. it, it certainly kind of set off a wave of talent and, and that, that we're still here now when you turn on the radio. Yeah. You know, like, earlier on, I was watching a clip of... Uh, Frank Skinner giving out a Brit Award, you know, to So Solid Crew, mm. and it's just those things kind of almost disappear from your memory. But you do go back to that point and realise that it was culturally significant. Oh, it was a huge point. I've been very lucky to be a part of a pioneering wave a lot of the time. So you know, like with Bullet Boy, it was mm. kind of like the first wave of those sort of, of movies films. and yeah. that genre. And then um, with, in music, with So Solid, just being, you know before pre-grime pre all of that stuff and being a part of it so yeah I've been lucky to be a part of that but I think yeah there's the reason why Soul Solid is still I suppose out there now and I suppose will be part of music history in the UK Um, do you think artists like so like Giggs or like uh, Skepta or Kano or those people that have had like success in recent years do you think they'd have taken if not like kind of like from like musically as in I mean like the sound of the oh. of like So Solid Crew but the sort of opportunity to speak kind of like candidly and honestly about stuff do you think they would be doing that if you hadn't kind of knocked down the doors if that made sense I, pre- I, I, I mean there's a huge possibility that they wouldn't I'm sure someone else would have come after us and, mm-hmm. and tried to push the boundaries the same way or whatever but I think you know the impact of So Solid the impact of these guys constantly going to prison and firearms and this and being debated in the House of Parliament and having our, our tours shut down and everything like that was just like it was just like a huge oh, Jesus Christ what's going on sort of thing now you know gangster rap and all sorts of stuff is like you know gigs can pretty much say what he wants mm. in his music or whatever we had to fight for that um, I grew up with gigs so we're, we're, we're really good friends and we grew up in the same estate and I saw him come up 
you know what I mean, and what he was doing and whatever. And there was no room for him in the market when I was making music. He was still making music then, and I was, you know, I was doing mixtapes with him and his brother and stuff like that, but you weren't allowed to listen to that stuff then, and it definitely weren't allowed to be playing on any mainstream radio. But if you listen to mainstream radio now, wow, there's room to say that we did a kick open this door mm. for a lot of these people that are working now and a lot of them will say I talked to Tiny I talked to Reg or whatever Chip will openly say like ah, you man got me into this we respect that and love that where does music sit in your life now? Um, in terms of the pecking order I mean presumably family first because it's busy times <laughs> no never forget family bro music is still like it's my heart mm. Like, you know, I'm, I'm producing all the time music or whatever. No one's probably ever going to hear it. A lot of people don't like it and the stuff that I'm doing or whatever. And, you know, but it's for me, it's therapeutic. It's, it, it makes me feel better. I'm still trying to find... I know I've got a place in music somewhere. Mm. I'm still trying to find it. I don't know whether I'm going to end up being a producer or, you know, like writing mm. for other people or doing this or doing that. But I think there's still some sort of place for me somewhere. So... I, would, I mean, that's something I'll do till the day I die. I don't, I don't look for any comeback from doing music, mm. um, and I like being an underdog mm. as well. But just look at Craig David. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, he's done he's done wonders for everyone as well. He's the mm. revival king. He's the comeback king. I swear <laughs> down. He's a, he's amazing. I could, when he was doing it, I was thinking, Craig, I'm not sure, mate. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Maybe give it a break. But um, he's a persistent, consistent guy. So I, I, I love it. I love the freedom of music right now and the creativity and how people are, are dealing with it. But I don't know whether, you know, I have a place right now in, in that market. But when it comes to acting and the other side of what I do or whatever, it's, it's going really well. Yeah, and the future is looking really good. What's on the horizon for that stuff? We're still trying to, you know, we're trying to get Top Boy together again who knows whether that will happen or not mm. you've been a big champion of wanting it to come back right yeah of course of course I mean for, for various reasons but because um, people have been able to discover it again it's one of those things that through is it on Netflix now yeah yeah, yeah. It's, getting, it's doing Netflix Netflix US and so people have been picking it up there yeah. and lots of famous fans been kind of yeah 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 yeah. you've got your obviously you've got your, your Drake I mean like Drake is I can say this like Drake is heavily Involved okay. with Top Boy, and he wants to bring it back to our TV screens as well as his and everyone else's. Yeah. But um, and he, he's he's he holds the core values of the show quite high. Mm -hmm. So he's not he doesn't want to Americanize the show. He doesn't want to do anything. He's just about like you know you guys do what you do, mm -hmm. and. No, this, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know what I mean? It's like he doesn't want to touch it like that. He just he, he feels that it deserves to be have a place, mm -hmm. um, which is brilliant. So he's been kind of pioneering that for us, and there's been several meetings going on, and um, the producers of the show originally have been flying out, meeting him in LA, and he's been coming here and stuff like that. So watch this space. I suppose that we're all kind of desperate to make it happen. Um, I never say never, but I also never say it's gonna, um, just in case it doesn't. Uh, people will slaughter me for it. But other than that, I'm, you know, I'm writing, I'm producing stuff myself now, I'm writing stuff myself. There's been loads of stuff that we haven't talked about because your career, I mean, literally from being, well, from such an early age, from like 10 years old acting through to the music in your kind of teenage years, into your 20s and now into your 30s, what would, I mean, so much has happened can you remember what it feels like to be in your own mind like 10 years ago and like 20 years ago? You've evolved a lot as like a person. So what do you think you'll be like in another 10 years time? <laughs> I don't, to be, really? I guess, what, would you, what would you say? Because I, I'm stumped. I don't know. The final word can go to your wife. I don't know. I think you'll be a, a lot more calm. Cool. Calmer. Um, I think that you'll going to directing and producing a lot more than acting he always likes a challenge and to find new things to do so yeah but his heart will never change he's got a good oh heart. sweet oh sweet yeah I disagree with all of that <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking I just 10 year plan thing my mum was always saying about like having like 
a plan Plans. and you know where you want to be parents whatever. always want to see that don't yeah. they yeah to be honest I don't know but I don't know because the possibilities are endless this world has to change at some point you know and it evolves or whatever so who knows I might be down in street you never know Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Production by Emma Snook. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com.